Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, uh, Ricky Camilleri. Have you ever felt like the odd one out in a group of friends? The new film, Terrell, by Sebastian Silva, explores those awkward feelings to a painful and sometimes hilarious degree. Let's take a look at the trailer. Photographs have just been released by the National Park Service. You remember the dispute about the inaugural crowds. President Trump How you doing? Nico. Tyler. Tyler. Hey, Tyrell. Nice to meet you, man. Oh, it's actually Tyler, but... Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. I really appreciate you having me. Oh, man. A friend of Johnny is a friend of mine. Ooh, happy birthday, Pete. Happy birthday! So he's at it. Nobody knows what that is. Black accent. You know what I mean? Come on. You, no, you have to be more specific than that. No? All right, you disappeared last night. What's wrong with me going to sleep? Tonight. Right. You were definitely pretending to fall asleep. Why are you making it weirder than it already is? Why is it weird in the first place? <laughs> Action! Oh. You see, Tyler, you're not the only black man here. I don't Grab his jacket. Give me his clothes. Oh, oh, I'm dying! Tyler, never trust the white man. <laughs> they will let you die in the wilderness. Oh. Bitch ass ain't picking the phone up, huh? Come on, chill. Hey, 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 hey! Hey, hey, hey! How much of a man are you? Oh, you wanna find out? You ready? Come on! Everybody, please put your hands together from Terrell, Christopher Abbott, and director, writer, Sebastian Silva. Hey, guys. Hey, how are you, man? Hey. I'm good. Thanks so much for being here. Congratulations on the film. Thanks so much. Uh, I love your work, and I think this sort of fits right along with a, a lot of the work that you do, the way that you explore pathologies, I think especially American pathologies in the last few years. Um, so obviously, I think a lot of people will think that this stems from the election of Trump and the way lots of people have felt about that. but. I think it's deeper than that. I mean, you yourself are a foreigner living in the United States. I imagine you have found yourself in, I mean, I'm assuming that maybe you have found yourself in a position or a feeling like uh, Tyler has found, finds himself in this movie. Is that incorrect to assume? No, 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 that many times. Uh, not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to do with being a foreigner in America, though I have been actually, um, I remember this time at the Hamptons that I was invited by a friend and I felt so alienated. I just hid in a room pretending to be drunk for a long time. But, <laughs> but I felt that way before even among Chilean people or, people or family members, you know, like a feeling of alienation um, can come unexpectedly uh, with any group of people, I feel. Yeah. That you are describing, now that you said family members, you are describing my Christmas coming up. It's going <laughs> to yeah, be me in a room going, to I'm too drunk, I'm too drunk, I can't come out for dinner. Uh, the, you guys work uh, largely improvisationally, right? I mean, uh, do you work mainly from an outline and then you guys get together and are kind of crafting the scenes together as actors? Well, not necessarily in this movie, right? No, as I mean, much? Wrote, I mean, I don't know. It, it, was, it was like a somewhere between a script and an outline but i mean no i mean we we improvised around scenes but uh i, th I feel like we would kind of usually do the, the scene as written first and then just kind of yeah i mean for for, for for nasty baby and crystal fairy there was actually like very short uh, treatments like 10 pages 20 pages but for this one there was actually an 85 page screenplay that the actors never read actually do you remember <laughs> like i was like guys come on it's like because Wait, tell, we tell we, no, because we shot it for uh, 11 days and really we didn't have time but we did have some uh, uh, gatherings where we did readings and people came up with ideas for their own characters so we had a sort of like 
uh, soaked ourselves in this environment and what was going to happen. But we were following a pretty strict sort of guide. You know, the script was pretty solid. Uh, but but also there, because you're shooting for 11 days, you don't necessarily have the time to be very distinct. In yeah, yeah, yeah. No, line, I mean, right? like, we would never follow word by word. They really did. It's partly your fault, though. We, like, we, we <laughs> came into this thinking, like, oh, this is going to be very loose and whatever. And then Sebastian get mad when, like, we didn't know our lines. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, because, like, the actions are very clear, you know, the, but there's 11 guys in a room constantly, you know? So you can only take care of, and you can only write on paper what the, where the attention is really focused, you know? Whoever is a, a, a talking head on the scene, but then you have nine other people or seven other people around those characters that need to be talking about something. So in that sense, there was constant improvisation from all the cast members. So I imagine that with a, how many guys? It was 11? Did you say it was 11 no, guys? Well, counting the dog, right? <laughs> That's a guy. He was a right. guy, yeah. Uh, did you ever find that the set itself ended up feeling a little like the movie? Yeah, totally. I mean, in a way, luckily it was only like 11 days in a way. I mean, it was, we had a, a long time. We had a great time, but we all lived in the same house. Yeah. Um, like we, would, we lived in the same house, and then we would just go shoot at a different house. Um, like a mile down the road. So kind of it all, you know, it was like life imitating art in, cer in certain ways and very little sleep. But it was, yeah, it was really fun. And it was really cold. It was like the dead of winter. Yeah, I mean, luckily it wasn't the same situation as the movie, meaning like... No, yeah. Yeah, Jason didn't feel alienated <laughs> and, and harassed by microaggressions by white people, um, or at least that I know of. Uh, but he, yeah, he seemed pretty comf com comfortable and confident, but... Yeah, the claustrophobia for sure. Like, 10 guys, a lot of testosterone in one house, like, short days, you know, like, short uh, daylight, you know, because it was in the middle of the winter, so four, it was already dark. Um, so, yeah, it felt pretty claustrophobic right. at times. Can you talk about um, performing those microaggressions that, that Jason's character feels a lot of the time? Because you're all, it's a group of liberal guys who essentially feel like they're all really good. I mean, it's kind of the problem of liberalness sometimes is that you assume that you are the best and that you are as good as you hope that you are rather than paying attention to the things that you do wrong. Right, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably more of a certain just unawareness of sometimes of the things that you say more than an outright microaggression. microaggression. It's just kind of being, uh, maybe just insensitive to um, or being kind of blasé about 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 things. A dismissiveness, and, right? That if Jason's character was like, this so felt that way, also that, nah, he didn't mean it that way. It's fine. It's yeah, right. There's cultural Assum obli assuming. obliviousness, too. Like, <laughs> yeah. things are ju just not aware, you know? Like, well, for instance, like, one microaggression is, like, when one of the characters calls him Tyrell. The... the, 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 the the name of the guy is Tyler, really, you know? But then somebody calls him Tyrell right at the beginning of the film when he arrives, and then he lets it go pretty easily, you know? Yeah. So that it could be considered a microaggression, right? Like, the guy just said his name. It's Tyler. You're calling him Tyrell. So... Um, but it's new. It's more... It's kind of nuanced in that way. Because, it, it, yeah. I mean, on one hand, that's an honest... It could be just an honest mistake. Right. But, on the, but when you kind of look deeper into what that mistake is, there's, there's kind of something... Uh, a little more wrong about it, you know? Uh, but it taps into something that's like very clearly happening right now in our right now in our culture, whether it's dealing with race or sexism, which is so often the perpetrators of microaggressions are kind of unwilling to recognize those microaggressions because they've never felt that. Right. And so when someone's like, hey, that thing that you said hurt me or affected me, it's like, no, 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 come on, I didn't mean to do that, or that's not really what I was doing, rather than really being able to listen and sort of withstand the criticism that comes from perpetrating microaggressions. For sure, I think a lot of times also they're not even they're not even told that that's what's going on, you know. So that what's I I believe has somehow perpetuated these microaggressions, you know, because it's also not in the it's not the responsibility of the of the victim to be educating everybody of what would offend you or not, you know, but. It sucks, but it kind of is at some points. You know, if like if Tyler doesn't tell them that that was offensive, they would probably do it again to somebody else without even knowing. Right. Where did this come from for for you? This telling a story about microaggressions like this. I mean, really, like I've I've dealt with the the subject of alienation in most of my. I've made eight movies, and I I think five of them alienation and not belonging and wanting to belong. Uh, it's really the main thread, you know. So. It is, it is a 
it is very familiar subject, but like the this, this specific sort of like um, race dynamics and, uh, and these sort of um, subtle microaggressions that could be seen as, or yeah, understood as forgivable or, um, um, I just, just by being in America for so long and just witnessing it constantly. We, um, originally the anecdote is that I was with a good friend in Cuba um, and then we saw this group of uh, white kids in their mid-twenties American drinking rum out of the bottle being obnoxious and uh, playing a lot of games and like one of them was black and then he seemed to be tailing behind and feeling a little of an outsider but um, we started reading into it just because he was black, because he could have been just having a bad day or just uh, not feeling that he wanted to participate, but you cannot sort of um, ignore ignore that narrative. You know, it's like, it's too strong. So that's why Tyrell, uh, it's a movie, because Tyler is black. Because if he was white, then he could have pot potentially suffered all of the alienation he suffered, but then the audience doesn't feel the 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 and attuned to yeah the suspense or the thrill or the danger that these dynamics have because of the history of America, you know. So that's what makes the movie so um, special, I think. How often do you find that your your movies or your stories come from a single incident that you end up sort of obsessing over and that ends up building out into an 80, 90 minute narrative, be it an image or just a person or a small story that you heard? I guess all of them, all truly. Of them, yeah. yeah, all of them. I never think like, hmm, I want to do a gangster movie. Like, I, it's never, it's never how it's. See your gangster movies. Yeah, so. yeah, I know, it'd be fun. But uh, yeah, it never. It's usually very personal, like things that I've lived myself, or things that I've observed, or people that I've met. You know, um, yeah. yeah. I, most all of them, I would say. I mean, what I like about what I like about your movies too, it seems like everything it's like everything is about like a domino effect so there's one small usually like one or a few very small gestures that happen and how those kind of blow up and kind of expand into like much much bigger things you know yeah. and that's um that's always fun to watch um one person in the film that is uh, always just so wonderful to have in anything uh i mean outside of every all the guys is yeah. endowed who is just i think the greatest uh actress working right now she's amazing what was it like getting her in the film she was incredible. Um, I was very impressed that she accepted such a small part, you know. Um, and then I, I kind of was unaware of what she means as an actress, meaning like narratively, you know. She, I've, I've learned that she always plays kind of a psycho, right? Does she? she or like a danger, like right? Psycho or oh. a deeply soulful, beautiful person. It's right. Like oh, okay. It's either like, or. In like hereditary, she's right. like you know. I mean, she's fantastic in that. Right. Hereditary or The Leftovers. Yeah. Or, um, what, or like, I guess, The Handmaid's Tale as well. She was amazing. She uh, she, um, she, and her son are in the movie, actually. Oh, that is her, that's yeah. her son. She has, yeah. She has an African-American son she adopted, and, like, he's part of the movie, and uh, it became very cathartic for the both of them, and it was a beautiful experience. They were, she was, um, well, I, I would be giving that. it away. Because I've, yeah. interv I've interviewed her, and we she loves talking about her son and the experience, and, you know, uh, she just has this deep, profound love for her son that, like, rarely do act people come on the stage and talk about. And I was wondering when when, when the son appeared, if that was her, her kid. For some reason, I... I That's assume, him. Yeah. She wow! Was amazing, yeah. And did she pitch that to you? Did she ask if that could happen? No, because she uh, she read the script and she's like she really felt for the script, you know, because it's basically an African American suffering through a weekend of alienation for reasons that he's not even that aware of, you know. Like so, it's sort of um, it's a burden, I believe, that a lot of African Americans live with, and she felt for her son, you know, and she understood the struggle and she felt compelled to it. And then uh, she told me and I'm like, bring him on, like, of course, like, wow. it's perfect, yeah. These movies, like these kind of smaller movies that have that sort of imp more of an, an improvis improvisation sort of feel allowed for those sort of invitations, you know? She's like, oh, I have a, an African-American son. I'm like, bring him in. And it's like, you don't have to ask anybody and it's perfect and it's so organic. And then it could have been 
any better, you know? Right. So that's like that's what's so great about making these movies that you're in total control of. How did you end up filling out the cast of, of guys along alongside Chris and, and Jason and and Michael and everybody? It was just like a really it was very easy phone calls, I guess. Yeah. Well, we were friends already. Yeah, and um, so was Michael, and like most of the rest of the cast. Because yeah. whoever is not an actor that you've seen is my friend, and there's ten of them. So Michael and Chris are friends. Jason, I had never met. And I went and met in New Orleans, and then we really clicked, and he was in Caleb. I had never met, and he was such a hero because we had an actor that was going to play that character, but, like, two weeks before he got cold feet, like, he's like, I don't want to get involved in this. This is, seems really? tricky. Yeah, he felt like since the movie was not directed by a black person, we could get in trouble because of potential accusation of appropriation or whatever it was, you know, but then... I don't know, it felt like um, we all felt that we were doing a very honest thing and like, and a very well informed and well intentioned. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we had to let him go. Like, he just got called feet really yeah, very, close do, to get a different director? very close to the shoot. And then I'm like, oh, fuck, I'll play that guy, whatever. And then. Which you've done before. I did it once, right, yeah. yeah. But then my DP, Alexis, uh, had worked with Caleb in the Fro Fro Florida project. And, um, and we called him like three or four days before the shoot, and he was such a hero. He flew from Texas right to set yeah. and played that annoying, antagonistic character. Because I feel like you're the type of actor that um, cinephiles really love right now because you seem to also be a cinephile and only working with directors of a certain caliber who are either taking risks or have already kind of established that they're really good behind the camera and want to do th great things. Is that a purposeful thing on, the, uh, on your part? It's, I mean, it's a little bit of both. I mean, it's a little bit about choices, but it's also kind of uh, just happenstance also. You know, like, again, like working with Sebastian, like we just happened to become friends through um, my friend Antonio Campos and, and his wife Sophia, who uh, edited this movie. And Sophia's edited like a bunch of uh, Sebastian's movies. So it's just like a lot of it, you know, and, and so like with the borderline guys, like, I, you know, I'd worked with them and that's when I did James White and then, um, uh, the movie Piercing was uh, with Nick, and Nick helped edit James White. So it's all kind of like there's a bit of that, but it's all kind of uh, just happened through circles of friends, also. And, and luckily, they're all really, really talented. So basically, hanging around New York City filmmakers, just and having just them picking each other. picking good company. Yeah, that's 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 most of it. Was there anything that made you nervous going into this movie in terms of being surrounded by 10 guys in a, in a house for 11 days? You're projecting right now. I totally yeah, am. I, I told know, you guys you told in the green that room. that story. Yeah. And, and that it terrifies me to be around large groups of men. Will it make you upset if I wasn't scared at all? No. <laughs> it would make me upset. No, yeah. like you're, you're a braver person than I am. No. I see groups of men walking down the street. I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, you changed yeah. sides. I mean, side I, again, really like, you know, we shot it really, really quickly, and we knew it was going to be like 11, 10, 11, 12 days or whatever. So, I mean, knowing... Knowing that in the back of my head, and knowing like because we all lived in the same house and blah blah blah, so knowing that the the time span was pretty limited going into it, I think created that was a, a bit of a safety net in itself. Mm -hmm. But also, it's like it kind of feels like camp in that way too, and it's just nice to kind of uh, it was fun like all being being the same house and there wasn't like that much crew and you kind of it was very it was very freeing. No, I wasn't I wasn't too nervous. I mean, again, I knew some I knew a lot of the guys too, right. and so. Um, no, I wasn't. I, if I if I was alone in the process and didn't know any of the other actors, and it was ten guys, yeah, I think that would be a little. Because a lot of actors have you know different yeah, types of egos, and like, and that could get kind of strange and competition and like competitiveness. And well, this is like a group <clears throat> of. I, I will say this is, seems to be like a group of actors who are all who strive to make similar bodies of work. Like everybody seems like they would be on the same page in this. They movie. were, and they, yeah, there was no, there was no bigger, biggest ego on set in that no, way. It's gonna be kind of sitting there being like, what is this movie? It's like 10 days, come on guys. Like, yeah, exactly. Everyone seems like they're gonna be trying to make no, the best thing possible. Everyone knows what they're getting into. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it tough when you are making something in 11 days and the vibe is supposed to be in every shot that it's a fun party and everybody's having a good time, is it tough to kind of maintain that vibe for the actors even though you're, you're <laughs> moving like this? I mean, to be completely honest, it was, we are working hard, but for the same reason you want to be loose, you know? So a lot of the time we were stoned on set, you know, or whatever, like drinking whiskey, not like crazy that you're like, you can, you're not uh, able to work, you know? But like whoever wants to smoke weed is 
invited to do so and like we're not like we're not stressing out it's not a set that we're like stressing people out you know like we are we're, it was such a cooperative uh, effort you know and like nobody was getting paid that much it's like we're just making a good movie about a timely subject uh, in like cra in a crazy time in America you know so it's like it felt like a it felt like a really great exercise to do together as a family and yeah of course like there were times that I'm like Guys, come on, like, learn the fucking lines. Like, you have the screenplay at home. But you just told us to get stoned. What do you want me to do? I was yeah. not directing them to get high, but like, they were, if they wanted to. Why don't you know, you know, know your life? Because I'm Yeah, stoned. exactly. Like, no, we were, at some points, we were losing our minds because, like, yeah, the, the, the set is really loose. Like, I really appreciate a good movie. I'm not a resp an irresponsible director, but I'm not a director with with like a masterpiece in mind. I don't care. I don't think that way. I don't, uh, I really appreciate. How do you think? What's the most important part of the project for you? I mean, for me, it's for it to be legit and never a tone deaf and, uh, and not be a tyrant on set and not be one of those directors that are yelling at people or fighting with actors. I hate divas. I don't work with, I don't like collaborating with people that feel that they're making you a favor, you know? So it's really about, Camaraderie, yeah, camaraderie. Yeah, I can't say it again. It's only once. I can only say that word once a day. Um, but um, yeah, that was like it felt like a really loose, but also very hard. It was a very hard working experience. You know, it's like eleven days, no days off. That's why eleven days and like at least thirteen to fourteen hours a day. So yeah, a joint is welcome. You know, when you're working like that. Talk about the um, the use of the Trump pinata as a kind of microaggression. Um, just it's like a full on like full on like not, murder. Not yeah, very micro. That yeah, one. it's not that micro. Well, it's an aggression towards Trump, but the idea or the expe expectation that Tyler is supposed to be as gung ho or as engaged in this sort of destruction right, of yeah. a Trump pinata as these nine liberal liberal white guys. That in itself, as much as I don't think it's said out loud, felt to me like a kind of micro like we assume and we expect yeah. you to be as angry no, as that, we are that's interesting because it was a point that i was trying to get across it's very subtle but it's like you know you like racist or microaggressions or like uh, forms of racism are only expected from like white nationalists you know or something like that but they actually come from a lot of them from liberals like even an an hyper apologetic attitude towards somebody that you feel awkward about, it's also a microaggression, you know? It's like um, giving a standing ovation to a movie that you haven't seen because it was directed by a black person, it's a microaggression because of how patronizing that is, you know? So microaggressions are not necessarily saying Tyrell to a guy that names Tyler, so... Um, what was the question? The Trump thing. The oh, the Trump, yeah. But the, but the pinata thing is also such an inane act and like doesn't actually get help, you know, it doesn't further anything. It's just getting out, you know, getting out frustration right. over an, an inanimate object, which is stupid in itself. So even, um, you know, e even his re uh, rejection to, to like want to kind of like take part in that is more just probably because this is like a dumb thing to do that doesn't really Yeah, and that, also, and also, guys are saying, but you should, you should want to do this. They actually, I think, think Sarah even says that. To right, but it's also point. because, uh, it's also yeah. because, um, I feel that white liberals are so enraged by Trump and I feel that, or at least that I've talked to some black friends that it's like, yeah, it's things have been shitty always, exactly. you know? It's not that with Trump things are gonna get that much worse for us either, you know? So it's like, it's more of the same bullshit, you know? Um, I think white liberals are so, myself included, so assumptive of everybody else's opinions. Like, you sh you don't feel the same way as me, but things are crazy. You should feel, and every people are like, no, leave me alone. I don't necessarily, I'm not as angry as you are yeah, about no, this. Yeah, that's a good catch, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The fact that he's not that, uh, yeah, engaged with this, collective hatred, you know? And I feel like you walk a really fine line in the film about having these microaggressions appear, but are not necessarily called out by Tyler at a certain point. He doesn't like put a litany, to, a list together of everything that has driven him crazy or why he's upset. So you operate on this very subtle line that I, I wonder if was difficult for you and if you shot more stuff that you ended up cutting because you needed more to play with in terms of what is clear and what isn't yeah. clear to the audience. I mean, they were there on the screenplay because you need the things like, for instance, like, and that's why the movie for me is interesting that 
a lot of things could be thought as a microaggression. For instance, when they're having breakfast and Tyler wants to put sugar on his grits and then people are like, you put sugar on your grits and then it's just a cultural sort of boundary there, but it's not necessarily a black thing. It could be a Southern thing that he likes his grit sugary, you know? And then it's this cultural sort of division or, or curiosity and then the amount of questions that spark from the sugar and the grits could be maybe considered a microaggression or not. And like, there's so many of those and like, and that's what, that's where the movie kind of lives. It's like, is that a microaggression? Should, should I not, should I not say it? Should I, should I pretend that I'm not impressed by sugary grits or should I just call it out? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's this sort of like walking on eggshells uh, situation. I was gonna say, has microaggression ever been used that so word so, so many times in one, in one interview <laughs> as, as this one? <laughs> No, I don't know if it has, actually. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Hey, first of all, thank you both for being here. Um, uh, Christopher, I'm a big fan of your work. I've seen Josh Mond and uh, Antonio Campos' stuff uh, oh, before. So thank you for being here. Um, my question is actually for Sebastian, though. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering what uh, your mindset was like going into making this film, being a foreigner, and like telling an American story. Uh, were you nervous about taking that on, or like, what was your mind? Yeah, I guess the the American cult, the American aspects of the story, which are, are are solely cultural, you know, because I was really taking, I'm telling a human story, you know, and like as I said before, I've done movies about alienation, and I was sort of in charge of following the emotional and spiritual uh, fallout of my main character, you know, but all of the sort of cultural subtleties were uh, in total collaboration with Jason and the rest of the cast that are mostly American, you know? So I fell in good hands and, and um, yeah. So, so yeah, that mainly, like uh, whenever I felt slightly insecure about something I would ask, you know, and, and sort of uh, democratically decide what felt right culturally. But also, sometimes it takes an outsider's perspective to be pretty in tune with the um, the ways in which Americans treat each other and are uncomfortable and awkward around each other. We're so in, engaged in it that sometimes right. an outsider can come in and be like, this is weird, let's make a movie about that. Right. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hi. Um, so I, on the trailer, it said something along the lines of the scariest not horror movie. Um, and so I'm curious about the mechanics of that. Um, like, how did you make this movie scary, even though it, it's clearly right. not a scary movie. I can give away, I cannot give away the ending, right? But like, I gotta say that this movie turns really terrifying and tense, almost unbearably tense for Americans, mostly. Because I had other like black Caribbean friends or from Europe or even white people from South America or whatever that are, whoever was an American understood this, this story and felt the tension and the awkwardness. But I think Americans project a lot of their own sort of stereotypes and uh, social conditioning prejudices uh, of what a movie with racial tensions should end up like or be like, you know? So the horror really comes from within the audience. It's not really explicit with the movie or the narrative, but like I learned while showing the movie that, that yeah, Americans were projecting all of these gory scenes into the movie, which is, it helps the movie for sure, you know? But uh, yeah, that's where the horror comes from, from their own prejudices. I think I have for one more question. Jen, who has the microphone? Right Hello. here, hi. Hi. Um, so I am actually studying screenwriting and directing right now at NYU, so my question's a little bit more for Sebastian. I know that you wrote and directed this project, so I was wondering if you could kind of talk about that a little bit more and how you got to the point where you're able to direct your own writing and um, if that was something you always knew you wanted to do and kind of how you got to where you are. No, I really never, I, I, I'm, I paint a lot and I thought I was gonna be a painter and then I ended up being a filmmaker really kind of by l chance. And, uh, and then after the first movie I kept doing it and yeah, I've only directed things that I've written and that's why my movies have remained pretty small, you know, and independent. Um, and in this movie particularly, the, the writing was very, 
It was very brief. It was like a 10 days, two weeks writing window. And um, and it, and it, um, this is a good example of a movie that can be written that way because you put up a situation, as you were saying, like you, you, you play some stakes, you know, it's like one black guy among white guys in a, in a cabin and then any, any sort of action that Tyler does in this movie um, gives you room to write a very charged emotional or psychological scene, you know? Like, even though like, let's say like a random new scene, like they go get groceries, right? And then he goes, it's like Tyler and Chris or Tyler and Michael Sarah's character and they go and then Michael is getting beer and Tyler is on, in line with some bread, whatever, waiting, and then some lady cuts him off in the line. And she's like, is that a microaggression or is this lady always cutting the line? And then, then you have a new scene, you know? So it's like, it's a screenplay that was very easy to write because of that reason. You're like, okay, what happens in a weekend? Like, people have breakfast, people play games, people go out, leave the house, they come back, they set up a fire, they make dinner, right. and you that's have, you have limitations in that way, which is probably exactly, you, yeah, you yeah. like kind of give yourself limitations to kind of play. You're play just yeah, you're just using like house. yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're just yeah. using the domesticity of a weekend in a country house to write your story. But that's really that's why vacation movies or road trip movies are so easy to write too. I think once you have a certain amount of rules set up and you're just writing around that, yeah, yeah. you're not sort of you don't have that blank page going. This could be anything. Exactly. What do like I do? The setup is forcing your story in a way that is very freeing and 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 makes it very easy and and and, and flows very easily too. I feel like your character, while uh, is incredibly sympathetic to Jason Mitchell's character, at times also grows a little frustrated with him as well. Uh, what was it like, sort of walking that line of being like a really sympathetic friend who's probably very aware of the situation, but also is kind of frustrated that your friend is getting in the way right. of your own phone. Well, it's like, it's a lot of things that like my character's kind of blind to, you know, even though like my character is like more like his good friend and he, you know, the, the premise is I'm bringing him up to this, uh, to this house for a weekend with these other guys that he doesn't know. So me and him already uh, know each other. And like we have a business together and we work together. And then so, and then later as the frustrations kind of start to uh, come up, it's more about, it's more about my frustration with him just as a person. Like, come on, just like, just be cool with, you know, these people, these are my friends too. Like be, you know, and, and it's kind of forgetting for not thinking about how he can, uh, like his true feelings in this situation. It's more, it's more kind of a obliviousness to, to maybe, to maybe what he's really feeling. And, but it's not, um, it's not for, you know, it's it's not it's not intentional. Again, on on my part at all, it's just kind of uh, just being, um, yeah, just kind of being oblivious to it. Well, he can't pay attention entirely to this one person. He's got to also see his friends and have his own good time as well. Right, exactly, yeah. and and just assuming that he he should and and would adapt to that naturally. And my frustration when he when he doesn't is is why is is kind of wrong i think on, on my part but not not intentional yeah and also when you become worried about him i think there's one tyler line that is like dude you don't need to ba babysit me you know right. so he's also pushing him away he's like dude like don't take care of me it makes it even awkward right more awkward right. Stop you know paying attention yeah it's like right. don't focus on me so much so right. there's no way out for anyone yeah, at the same time, he's kind of spiraling in his own way exactly. and demanding a certain amount of attention. Yeah. With a, by, not unintentionally, but, but demanding it. Mm -hmm. um, guys, I love the film. Congratulations. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Great work, uh, both your parts and everybody in the movie. Uh, it comes out this Wednesday, yeah. right? People can see it. Yeah, go to IFC. Go to yeah, IFC. Everybody. Go yeah. check it out. And everybody give them a big round of applause. Let's Thank hear you guys. Thank you. Thank you.